Welcome to STEM Unplugged, a monthly podcast designed to help you learn about STEM initiatives and to help advance STEM awareness. Now here's your host, Kelly Green. Welcome to STEM Unplugged. I'm so excited to be here tonight. This is your host, Kelly Green, the Chief Operating Officer of SciTech Institute, a collaborative nonprofit organization making STEM connections in Arizona and beyond. In the studio tonight, I have my team member, Claire Conway, who's working to build the Arizona STEM ecosystem one hub at a time and working groups based on interest around Arizona. Tonight, our focus is on workforce and career pathways. It's very relevant currently. And our guests for tonight will explore STEM in the military. So as many of you know, here in Arizona, we have numerous ways to get connected with military operations, contracting and support especially with Luke Air Force Base in Glendale, Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson, Marine Corps Air Station in Yuma, Fort Huachuca in Sierra Vista, and those are just the active duty locations. In this episode of STEM Unplugged, we have a very diverse group of guests, so thank you for coming on. We have Chaz Schrader, Nuclear Field Coordinator with the United States Navy, Celeste Snyder, Arizona Army National Guard, State Equal Opportunity Equal Opportunity, no, Equal Employment Manager, and Daniel Romero, the Director of Operations for the 56th Civil Engineer Squadron at Luke Air Force Base. So Chaz, can you tell us a little bit about what is going on over there in the Navy, a little bit about your background, how long you've been in, give us some details. Oh, we can't hear him. Oh, darn. It's okay. It's the uh, Navy. Oh, wait. Can oh. you <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me now? We can. <laughs> All right. Perfect. All right. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. My uh, I've been in for about eight and a half years now. I joined out of Southern California, where I was born and raised in the L.A. area. And uh, I'm out here in Phoenix now. Before this, uh, I was in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, for four and a half years, serving on a submarine out there, uh, doing uh, nuclear operator stuff. And now I am in charge of all nuclear field applicants in the Navy and kind of their process from start to finish uh, to make sure that I have people to replace me uh, out in the fleet. That's awesome. So Les, thanks for joining us tonight. I know you're TDY. Can you tell people what TDY stands for and what, what is your role? So um, TDY is temporary duty. And currently I'm in Carson City, Nevada with uh, uh, an advisory council meeting. Basically, um, my civilian job is with EEO, and uh, my military job is uh, diversity and inclusion. And I've been in the military for 26 years, and most of that time has been with the National Guard for Arizona. Excellent. And what about you, Daniel? So um, like, like you said, I'm here at uh, Luke Air Force Base. Um, I've been in the Air Force for about 12 and a half years. Uh, I'm currently a major and a second in command uh, within our, our organization, what we call a squadron. Um, I'm charged with uh, maintaining uh, um, and minor construction uh, across our Air Force Base. And uh, right now we're actually getting ready to um, plan and start to construct our new, our last of our phase of the F-35 project that's supposed to uh, come down here at Luke Air Force Base. Um, but I, uh, in my day-to-day -day job, I oversee about 200 people who, like I said, maintain uh, and sustain the entire $3.2 billion infrastructure we have here on Luke Air Force Base. And um, I have uh, guys and gals in, excuse me, sorry about that, guys and gals in different, um, career fields uh, such as uh, engineering assistants, so surveyors, if you will, from the civilian uh, standpoint, as well as electricians, uh, structural craftsmen, and um, our, what we call dirt boys, um, our heavy equipment operators. So we have about nine different crafts that work for me. Yeah, that's awesome, Daniel. Uh, I also wanna jump in and just say thank you to all of our guests for your service. And I wanna take a moment to acknowledge all of you as well as Kelly, you've got over 20 years under your belt, yeah? Yeah, I actually um, did serve as well. So thanks, Claire. My background was in logistics and military intelligence and I'm now a retired Sergeant First Class and uh, excited that we're having this conversation because it's really important that we highlight the opportunities in Arizona 
and beyond because military and STEM really do go hand in hand. And we're seeing now the opportunities in the civilian sector of those job skills that really do lead into great careers after service. So I'm a little curious and wanted to get into some of those misconceptions about the day-to-day -day operations in the military. I know many people, some parents um, shy away from signing up or raising the right hand because of the implied warlike atmosphere. But, you know, Daniel, you alluded to your day to day, right? What does that really look like? And I know I can speak for myself after two tours in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. It's not all run them and gun them and blow things up. We actually have special skills that we learned. And, you know, our military occupation specialties do lead to additional skills. So I kind of wanted to go back over to Chaz over there in the Navy, especially here in Arizona with Palo Verde operating uh, generating station out there in Tonopah. There's some great um, opportunities to even stay in Arizona if you want to get a career in the Navy and come back. Can you tell us a little bit about what those opportunities look like? Yeah, absolutely. So as you said, Palo Verde is a great opportunity, uh, you know, largest nuclear plant in the country and a uh, great place to work. Uh, and the Navy nuclear program pretty much sets you up perfectly to be able to uh, already have that education and job experience to have a kind of a seamless transition into uh, working there. But uh, outside of that, uh, there's even opportunities that plenty of my coworkers that I've gotten out have gotten uh, with tech companies. Uh, obviously, we are uh, solely just doing nuclear power things. You know, there's other auxiliary aspects and components that go into nuclear power. And most of uh, the people that I work with that have gotten out have actually gone into the tech industry as maintenance supervisors, uh, working on server farms or uh, working for hospitals doing a contract work for the electrical side or electronic side. And as Arizona in general starts to build up its kind of tech hub, uh, as all the countries continue to move out of California, uh, there's only gonna be more job opportunities uh, arriving in Arizona to be able to uh, facilitate those transitions. Yeah, I think that's super important and, you know, our kind of parent, right? We're the Arizona Technology Council Foundation doing business as SciTech Institute. So you talk about that tech sector and it just continues to grow with, um, on our last podcast, we were talking to NPower and talking about the electrical vehicles that are moving in and all of the different opportunities in Arizona. So that's a great skill set to have is that electrical and engineering background. Um, what, about, what about you, Celeste? Are there any specific, I mean, you said, how many years have you been in? I've been in for 26 years, so I've seen a lot. <laughs> yeah, just a few. So, you know, I think it's really important with your role as engagement, right? Talking about the skills that come with serving for that long, even if you're only in for a few years, what are some of the military soft skills that they call them in the civilian sector? Do servicemen and women really come out of service with having kind of a, a jump with you know, maybe leadership skills or communication, written and verbal. What are some of those that are maybe some of your favorite that you've seen? Well, one of the things that, that I've noticed is that uh, many, especially in my field of working with the uh, Army and in air with the National Guard, a lot of uh, organizational skills, project management, the ability to um, uh, task people and and to use individuals for their best skills. So I, I think that a lot of times the military members have this ability to basically determine quickly who would be the best person for the best areas. And I, and I think that that's a skill that the military helps us with making decisions quickly and, and also doing a quick survey of something without um, hesitation. We, we, make those decisions. And I think that's an important uh, skill. Yeah, that's important. We agree at SciTech. I think, Daniel, I'm going to kind of take you back a few years. So think about talking to eighth graders. We do a lot of outreach from zero to 103 with SciTech Festival. And I really want you to think about our students we serve in our leadership component. It's called the Chief Science Officers. If you were chatting with them and they already have some leadership skills and some of the basic drive to lead, 
what would you say to encourage them to consider the Air Force as an opportunity? So it was kind of along the same lines like uh, Celeste alluded to. It's um, it develops those interpersonal uh, relationships. Uh, it gives you those skills in order to build on those relationships. So typically, um, like for me, I wanted to be just a straight engineer. I wanted to des to design a lot of things. And what kept me in the Air Force was um, being able to lead people. Um, and knowing and, and learning those skill sets in order to be successful at it. Um, and I think that transfers directly into supervisory roles in the, in the civilian workforce. And, uh, you know, we're, we're charged with learning our skill set, uh, our engineering background, but also we are, are supposed to be leaders and, and followers at the same time. And so that's what, what's really uh, kept me in the Air Force is um, developing those skills and, and also not, not, not only in the STEM career fields, but I've also had the opportunities to be a teacher, which something that wasn't on my career path, uh, per se, um, something that I really didn't want to do, but that brought in my horizons and made me an even better, um, manager, if you will, and supervisor, uh, and knowing how to deal with people, uh, which is what you're going to do in everyday life. So it definitely sets you up for success. Yeah, I think going back to Celeste's point, being able to delegate those tasks and be able to uh, articulate exactly how to do it, step one, step two. That's what I loved about the military. But over to Claire, right? You're talking to a lot of our industry partners and asking them what are they looking for? And they're, you know, they're ready. They want students now as soon as they graduate. Like a lot of students maybe have a path in mind. They think they have to go to four years or um, some don't always look to the military, but I like to encourage it. But Claire, what are those industry partners saying they want now or in the next couple of years? Yeah, absolutely. Something that I'm hearing a lot that I have heard you all echo uh, just in what you've been talking about now uh, is accountability is something that they're really looking for in new employees, especially uh, employees who are maybe looking for their first job or uh, they're you know in sort of an entry level position and are looking to move up. They're really looking for that accountability. They're looking for leadership skills, communication skills, um, sort of the ability to uh, to mentor and teach and all of those things, I think, um, as you've been talking about, are, are great skills that you can develop uh, in ways other than, you know, traditional career paths that we might be hearing a little bit more about. It's kind of nice. They pay for your food, clothes, housing, <laughs> travel. I mean, come on. You got to go to Hawaii, right, Chaz? Like any yeah. any cool places, any other cool places that you can tell us about that you got to go to? <laughs> um, as far as, I mean, most of it's just been in country. I uh, just done a lot of training moving around. Uh, I got to go to uh, Knowles Atomic Project Laboratory in uh, upstate New York, which is really cool where they actually do like nuclear testing of like different materials. Uh, that actually go into it and kind of got a little uh, tour of the facility and got to see a whole bunch of cool stuff there. Um, and then, I don't know, just most of it's been around the country, being able to see and travel places that I never would have gone if I hadn't joined the military because I, I pretty much went to the same high school as my dad. So that kind of shows you that uh, we weren't going anywhere. So get on this the boat, gave me, buddy. get on the boat. Yeah, this <laughs> let me uh, see and do a lot of things that I otherwise wouldn't have done. But uh, four and a half years in Hawaii was definitely an experience I wouldn't trade. Yeah. What about you, Celeste? Any cool duty stations? Uh, you know, I'm I'm Arizona National Guard, so most of my duty has been here in the states. But they did send me to Saudi Arabia, and I've been able to see uh, you know different cultures there. But I will say, um, and to kind of piggyback on what he was saying, is that, uh, you know, the, the military, you can, you can start off at a high school graduate and, and leave the military with a complete skill. And college, uh, you and I have spoken about this before, that college isn't necessarily the first step for every person leaving high school, that sometimes going into a, a trade or, or gaining an experience or a, a, a skill through the military is the easiest way to to learn and grow and and uh contribute to society and and to use those skills to to be better and that's part of what my job as a diversity and inclusion officer is to assure that we are using the meritocracy system to to promote and to and uh to push people forward and to achieve greater things in their life yeah, I think that's a great point. What about you, um, Daniel? Did you go anywhere cool? 
So, Luke, Air Force so when I, yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> when I first, I'm a long way from home, by the way, all the way Where from, from? New, new Mexico. Oh, so, man, so <laughs> I'm actually long from way. upstate. So when he said upstate New York, I'm like, hey, you actually know it's not all city. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. So uh, they actually sent me back home to Holloman Air Force Base when I first uh, finished school. But um, so after that, so I got to. <laughs> Yeah, I know it was three and a half hours, so it wasn't so bad. I was home every weekend, but that kind of, I got tired of home. And so they, after that, they, I've, I've been to uh, Honduras. So I was stationed there for a year, got to work with the local population, doing a lot of humanitarian type uh, work and working with special uh, forces to kind of train their, their, uh, their uh, military, if you will. (laughs) And then uh, after that, I went to England and got to deploy to, um, to uh this middle east and then also got to you know where the jets go we've got to go as well to to set up that infrastructure for them so i got to go to norway and then also uh germany uh for some short tdy's temporary duty assignments so yeah i was gonna say one of my favorites was japan and i actually so for all of you out there listening the air force has the best food and the best lodging and, you know, the Navy's not bad. Army's kind of, eh, and then poor Marines. I just, I feel bad for them. But I was stationed in Camp Zama in um, Japan. And then I got sent up to the military station up in uh, Misawa at the air base. Oh my gosh, I had like an apartment. They had like a chef every, they had like Taco Tuesday. It was insane. And there were only like five of us army people. So we were all like, dude, don't tell anybody we're army. <laughs> Just enjoy the food. But um, that's really cool. So yeah, definitely for people to consider getting out of your space. It's really interesting that most people don't leave a 50 mile radius once they get comfortable in their spot. Mm-hmm. And I think the military kind of, gives you that opportunity to not only be with a diverse population, but to explore. So I wanted to bring that back because you sounded really excited, Chaz, when you got to take a tour. And we kind of want to highlight that, you know, Claire and I are doing a lot of these um, industry partner tours. And I know out at Luke, I got to go to Luke days. How did you get interested in STEM? Because our whole job at SciTech Institute is to kind of open everybody's eyes, like There are pathways you probably don't even know about, especially with the increasing technology and the rapid changes. Like, you know, this is a computer in our hand where it used to be three rooms at NASA. So I'm just kind of curious, what sparked your initial interest or were you kind of shoved by somebody say you're going in? (laughs) Hopefully none of you were like on a criminal path. but. (laughs) No, no, no. So, I mean, mine started young, uh, you know, always taking apart stuff and never putting it back together, just wanting to see how it worked and uh, getting yelled at a lot for that. But, uh, <laughs> and then after high school, uh, it was always something I was interested in, but just never really had an opportunity or an end that I could find. Not that they weren't out there, but uh, it was 2008, uh, right after the real estate bubble burst, and uh, the closest I could get was working for Best Buy at the time. Uh, but no, so I ended up walking into a Navy recruiting office and uh, didn't know that they had STEM programs. I mean, I didn't know anything about the military. I don't come from a military background, uh, nothing along those lines. So I was you know, blind walking into the office. And I took the practice test that they have there and they're like, hey, do you want to be a nuke? I was like, I don't want to build bombs. Right. (laughs) And I had a complete misconception of what nuke was. I didn't know that we had nuclear power plants in the Navy. And uh, so I signed up for it, kind of a leap of faith. And especially since I was always interested in STEM and kind of saw it as my way in. And then, you know, eight and a half years later, I'm here and loving it. Yeah, that's great. I know the rest of us have a few more years on you, but stick (laughs) it out. It's so worth it. (laughs) What about you, Celeste? I mean, I know you've had some different opportunities. What what kind of got you interested in joining the military? So I've always been interested in the military. However, I ended up marrying very young, so I didn't get to to, uh, go down that military path until I was in my late 20s. And what's nice about that is there was still a place for me, even at that age. And I was able to go into a field. So I'm a personnelist. I work with personnel and the DEI now 
And um, it, it just was always something that I wanted to do. I always wanted to, to serve and defend. I love our country so much. And it was just a, a something that, that moved me. And, and I do come from a military background. My father was um, Air Force during Vietnam. And um, my brother was a, a Sergeant Major with the Colorado Guard. And my other brother is uh, a maintainer down at the 162nd. And so my husband, military. So we, we have a lot of connections to the military. And I just think that it is an awesome place for people to grow in and to become those things that they they dream to become. Yeah, that's great. I again, like you talked about Chaz, you didn't know what was there until you talked to a recruiter. Now they will call you back repeatedly because they want you <laughs> yeah. to join, but ask a recruiter and you know, do some research, visit the web. We'll talk about that in a second. But what about you, Daniel? What got you inspired? So one word, Legos, yeah. right? So uh, growing up when I was a, a little kid, I loved, absolutely loved Legos. And so that gave me my passion for working with my hands. Um, but I quickly, uh, like um, when I was younger, my parents had taken me, they used to take me to air shows all the time. So just seeing the jets fly in the air just totally got me, I was so mesmerized, just uh, not wanting to fly them, but like so interested on in how they work and what, what makes them fly. Um, and so after shortly after that, I was about eight years old. My parents took me for a short ride or a, a vacation to, and we stopped at the Air Force Academy. And I just seen all those cadets marching and knowing that it was a super awesome engineering school. Um, that point on, I knew that's where I wanted to go. So I worked my way, uh, left home at 16 to go to a boarding school, put myself through boarding school, um, and actually got my appointment to the Air Force Academy. Uh, I originally wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and quickly realized that that wasn't my passion. And uh, that's how I stumbled on civil engineering and just working with dirt and construction and having a construction uh, job throughout high school kind of uh, pushed me along in that field. So um, I, I wouldn't have changed it for the world, so. Yeah, I think that's kind of a nice tie in to Claire too, right? You know, so you're a biomedical engineer by trade, but you know, listening to them, what is, do you hear the discipline? I know I, I'm army at the office sometimes. I try not to be. I try to put the yeah. hand away. But, um, <laughs> you know, what are some of the things you're hearing, again, for the workforce partners that you're collaborating with? What do, what do they bring to the table? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really interesting to hear just how much you've all talked about sort of personal growth and the ability to uh, learn these, these extra skills and take on extra responsibility. And um, I think it's something that a lot of people don't necessarily consider as a career pathway, particularly into STEM fields. I think, you know, people say, oh, I want to work on this particular thing. So I need to go be an engineer and I need to go to a four-year college to do that. And there are really so many other pathways into those, um, into those different fields. And I think uh, it's really exciting to get to learn a little more about your career pathways because I know uh, it's something I know very little about and I'm, I'm curious to hear more about it. So one other thing, you know, I know we're drawing closer to the close of tonight's podcast, but please stay connected. We appreciate all of you for being here tonight. And I also thank you for your service. Um, I'm curious about incentive, right? So especially now there's this lower draw to the military. Not everybody understands the opportunities available. And, it, you know, when I was a kid, it was kind of the only ticket out of town. So I'm curious if there's any specific program that has incentives to join or even, you know, I know Celeste, you're working on the diversity, equity, and inclusion. What are they looking for? If people are interested now, kind of what would you refer them to to find out more? Or how would you um, showcase your branch? Let's start with the Navy. <laughs> All right. So uh, I particularly have a bias with the uh, nuclear power program, obviously. Uh, it does have the highest, uh, and I'm enlisted, if that wasn't clear for the listeners. Um, so I am particularly biased towards the enlisted side, uh, but we have the, an officer equivalent as well, uh, if you do have a bachelor's degree and you want to go that way. But uh, we have a $28,000 enlistment bonus for anybody that signs up. You're automatically an E3, so most people that join are an E1, which means that you're pretty much being promoted twice just for the job that you qualified for. Uh, and one of the things that somebody told me when I first joined was 
get more out of the Navy than the Navy gets out of you, essentially saying, take advantage of every opportunity that you have. And one of the things that my training, because obviously none of us are going into our program having any knowledge of nuclear power whatsoever. Uh, so that kind of ground up uh, lessons that we got to teach us how to do our jobs actually translates into college credits. So I was getting paid essentially to be to go to college. I was a professional student for essentially the first two years I was in the Navy and uh, ended up transferring those to uh, Excelsior College out of Albany, New York. And I'm about less than a month away from uh, graduating for with my degree in nuclear engineering technologies. And I didn't pay a dime out of pocket. So I went from no college degree to joining the Navy and being paid to go to college or at least having them pay for the rest of my college to better improve my uh, abilities in the Navy and after for free. Yeah, that's incredible. Nice. So what about you, Celeste? Any specific opportunities Arizona is looking for or anything that you've come across your desk? I know it's a busy, busy day. You're up there in TDY, but any specific thoughts? Um, absolutely. So one of the big um, pushes for the National Guard is that we protect the homeland. And I'm sure many people have heard about uh, cyber hostage taking where companies data is seized and then held for ransom by folks. We actually have a cyber protection team here in Arizona, and they deploy to different states to help companies regain that information that they may have lost to hackers. So we are always looking for people in the cyber protection field, the IT programming. Um, we also have um, a huge program in Tucson with the UAVs, the unmanned uh, aerial uh, vehicles. And they fly all over the world with their folks, their pilots there in uh, Tucson at the at Davis Monthan Air Force Base. And they're National Guard, but they're at Davis Monthan. Uh. Um, and so we do have that field right there is always in demand um, as well with the National Guard. So, you know, we're, we're really looking for those cyber folks out there. Yeah, I know even on the industry side with our partners, there's over like five or 1500 cyber jobs open right now, you know, that not just entry level, but all the way up. So that's even in the civilian sector. What about you, Daniel? Any thoughts about uh, key things for the Air Force? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're just like any other service, we have our different uh, career fields that we we have. So we have a lot of STEM uh, engineering uh, career fields. But uh, to caveat that, we also have positions that, um, you know, we need to get the jets in the air. So we have uh, folks that uh, we, what we call maintainers who fix and work on jets and make sure that they're they're flying properly. But we also have logistics. So we also we always need that that supply chain. Uh, that come that we need our parts to come in. So we have logistics officers, uh, and also uh, not only do we have officers, we have the enlisted side as well. Um, but um, even if you come in enlisted and you you don't have that educational background, the Air Force will pay for you to get that educational uh, background because we value that education. Um, and not only that, uh, if you don't feel like you want to wear this every day, uh, we also have civilian positions, uh, especially in my squadron right now. We have vacancies galore and we're trying to hire uh, local civilians to come uh, beef up our, our team here at Luke Air Force Base. Yeah, that's a great point. I kind of alluded to it at the beginning. You know, I, I did logistics when I joined. I was a baby, 17. Um, but the supply chain and really understanding that there are so many pieces and parts, you know, even the Boeing Apache helicopter made out here in Mesa, like that to me, being in the army, that's like, Ah, premier fighting machine when you're in Iraq or Afghanistan and here comes the Apache, you know you're safe. But understanding that each component and the wiring systems and the dashboard and you know the propeller, all of those pieces that have to be put together to be able to even get it to you <laughs> to you know leave an airfield. I don't think everybody always stops to think about somebody is managing that there's this many parts in production. This is how it's getting shipped and packed and, you know, safely there, right? We talk about cyber hacking, but there's also, you know, unnecessary, um, I guess, tracking of those items, not unnecessary tracking, but people trying to get those items that shouldn't have those. So this has been a great conversation. Any final thoughts from you, Claire, about any of the things we've shared tonight? 
Yeah, I think this has all been really fascinating. Thank you all for uh, telling us a little bit more about kind of what got you to where you are now and how how your service has been able to help you uh, sort of reach your career and your personal goals. It's been great getting to hear from you all. Thank you. All right. And let's be honest, many of us joke about each other's brands of service, but together we are excellent collaborators to complete the mission and to protect the United States. So when we think of science, technology, engineering, and math in the military, there are so many career pathways for individuals to seek and engage with. So, and then shout out to the Coast Guard and the Marines. We didn't have them on tonight, but we appreciate you as well. So one thing I wanted to do is to encourage our listeners to get involved with the STEM community and the rest of your um, friends at the office, right? So our military members, you are STEM and it doesn't necessarily say it on your name tag, but think about what you do all the way to the machinists, to the welders, to the electricians. Those things are related to science, technology, engineering, and math. And I know over the course of time, some of you have your careers have changed, right, Chaz? Like since you joined eight Mm -hmm. years ago, there's been quite a bit of advancements, but we, maybe you're an industry professional seeking ways to make an impact, a student searching for a mentor or a community collaborator, hoping to meet the right people to help make it happen. We want to help you get connected. It's both the way Claire and I are here tonight, but Chaz, what's one way they can contact you or the Navy? Uh, the best way would to be uh, go on to navy.com uh, slash local. It'll allow you to find a local recruiter that'll help kind of guide you in the right path to get into the right uh, program for you based off of all of your qualifications. Or walk into that recruiter station and take the <laughs> take the mm-hmm. test, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Got them. All right. What about you, Celeste? Any um, ways they could get in touch with you or your organization? One of the easiest ways would be to just Google DEMA, which is DEMA, and it has a a section in there uh, that splits us up between state, uh, Army, Air, and then it has a career finder area, so it lists all our positions and and where you can find a recruiter for military positions, Air or Army, or even a civilian position that we might have, federal or state. So That's awesome. And Daniel, what about you? So along those same lines, uh, you can either Google it or uh, airforce.com um, and you can find your local recruiter. But I would say is you want to stop by the air, no matter what service you're thinking of joining, always stop by the Air Force recruiter. They'll, they'll get you situated. Yeah, we're going to give a little plug, right? Luke Air Force Days is coming up during the Arizona SciTech Festival. So definitely having, you know, if you can get a tour, right, or I know Palo Verde doesn't necessarily, it, COVID, right? Things are not available, but if they can go experience and get out there, maybe we could take some um, flight line tours virtually through the phone, right? We did that a little bit last year with one of the crew chiefs, but I think it would be really nice to encourage others to get out and even drive by, hear the sound of the jets. Maybe if you're out in San Diego, go check out, you know, the big ships. And then, of course, Army, woo, go Army, <laughs> head on. Uh, you can see the trucks all over on this on this freeway, but uh, head down to Fort Huachuca and kind of see what's going on down there. Well, so, so one one more plug real quick uh, yeah. is that uh, I know the past two or uh, last year we didn't have an air show. So loop days is coming up in March, the, the 19th and 20th. So um, we'll be heading that up. So look, look for more information when that starts to come out through the the press releases. Yeah, we'll definitely be sharing that out. We love that it's a signature event with SciTech. Well, we want to thank everybody for joining us for this episode of STEM Unplug, exploring STEM in the military. We appreciate all of you for being on the show and thank you to all of our service members and veterans for their service to our country and honor of Veterans Day and November. Thank you. If you would like more information, you can contact us at SciTechInstitute.org. This is your host, Kelly Green, and we would be glad to discuss how you can get connected. Thank you for joining us for this episode of STEM Unplugged. We encourage you to get involved in the STEM community and stay connected at SciTechInstitute.org.